Chapter 2 Transporters receptors and enzymes as the targets of psychopharmacological drug action About a third of psychotropic drugs target transporters for neurotransmitter other third target receptor coupled to G proteins and perhaps only 10% target enzymes Now let's see how transporters act as targets for drug action their classification and structure Neuronal membranes normally serve to keep the internal milia of the neuron constant. Most neurotransmitters are transported again into synaptic vesicles for storage after neurotransmission. Both these type of neurotransmitter transport that is the presynaptic reuptake as well as the vesicular storage utilizes a molecular transporter belonging to a superfamily of 12 membrane region proteins. These transporters have a structure going in and out of the membrane 12 times hence the name these transporters are a type of receptor that binds to the neurotransmitter prior to transporting it across the membrane there are two major subclasses of plasma membrane transporters some of these transporters are presynaptics and others are on glial membranes the first subclass consists of sodium chloride coupled transporters called the solute carrier SLC6 gene family and include transporters for monoamines such as serotonin norepinephrine dopamine as well as for the neurotransmitter GABA and the amino acid glycine the second subclass consists of high affinity glutamate transporters and are also called solute carriers SLC1 gene family in addition to these two there are three subclasses of intracellular synaptic vesicle transporters SLC18 gene family comprises of the vesicular monoamine transporters also known as the Vmats for serotonin norepinephrine dopamine histamine and the vesicular transporter for acetylcholine SLC32 gene family consists of the vesicular inhibitory amino acid transporters also known as the Vats and the SLC17 gene family consists of the vesicular glutamate transporters such as the V-glutes 1 to 3. Now let's further discuss SLC6 gene family as targets for psychotropic drugs. For reuptake mechanism of monoamines utilizes unique presynaptic transporters but the same vesicular transporter is used for all the three monoamines. The unique presynaptic transporter for serotonin is known as SERT for norepinephrine is known as NET and for dopamine it is known as DAT. All three monoamines has the same vesicular transporter as mentioned before. It is known as the VMAP2. In addition, each presynaptic monoamine transporter also has appreciable affinity for amines other than the one matched to its own neuron. Now energy is required to concentrate the monoamines into the presynaptic neurons which is provided by the transporters in the SLC6 gene family coupling the downhill transport of sodium that is down the concentration gradient with the uphill transport of monoamines that is up the concentration gradient this is made possible by coupling the monoamine transport to the activity of sodium potassium ATPase an enzyme sometimes called the sodium pump transporter which belongs to the SLC6 family and exists as a dimer but in the absence of sodium, there is low affinity of the monoamine transporter for its monoamine substrate and thus binding neither to sodium or the monoamine. But if a drug binds to the inhibitory elasteric site on SERT, this reduces the affinity of the serotonin transporter SERT for its substrate serotonin. If one wants to enhance the normal synaptic activity of these neurotransmitters or restore their diminished synaptic activity, this can be accomplished by blocking these transporters. Now let's discuss some other neurotransmitter gene families as targets for psychotropic drugs. There is a presynaptic transporter for choline, the precursor to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but no known drug targets this transporter. There is also several transporters for the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and these are known as GAT 1 to 4. In addition to anticonvulsant actions, this increases the synaptic GABA availability and may have therapeutic action in anxiety, sleep disorders, and pain. There are no drugs utilized in clinical practice that are known to block glycine transporters. 
The glutamate transporters belong to a unique family SLC1 and have a unique structure and somewhat different action compared to those transporters of the SLC6 family. One difference between the two is that glutamate does not seem to co-transport chloride with sodium when it also co-transport glutamate. Also, glutamate transport is almost always characterized by the counter transport of potassium, whereas this is not always the case with SLC6 gene family transporters. In addition, glutamate transporters may work together as trimers rather than dimers, as is the case in SLC6 transporters. Where are the transporters for histamine and neuropeptides? Histamine apparently does not have a presynaptic transporter, although it is transported into synaptic vesicles by the same VMAT2. Histamine's inactivation is thus thought to be entirely enzymatic. The same can be said for neuropeptides. Inactivation is apparently by diffusion, sequestration and enzymatic destruction. Vesicular transporters, subtypes and functions. The VMATs are members of the SLC18 gene family. The vesicular transporter for acetylcholine also belongs to this family and is known as V-ACT. The GABA vesicular transporter is a member of SLC32 gene family and is known as V-AT. The vesicular transporter for glutamate is called the V-GLUT123 and is a member of SLC17 gene family. The SV2A transporter is a novel 12 membrane region synaptic vesicular transporter of uncertain mechanism and with an unclear substrate. It is localized within the synaptic vesicle membrane and binds with the anticonvulsant levetiracetam, perhaps interfering with neurotransmitter release and thereby reducing seizures. The vesicular transporter's function is facilitated by proton ATPase, commonly known as the proton pump. Thus, neurotransmitters are not as much transported as antiported. Now let's discuss SLC18 gene family as targets of psychotropic drugs. Vesicular transporters for acetylcholine belonging to SLC18 family, GABA belonging to SLC32 family, and glutamate belonging to SLC17 family are not known to be targeted by any drug. On the other hand, vesicular transporters for monoamines in the SLC18 gene family are potently targeted by several drugs including amphetamines, tetrabenazine and risapine. Amphetamines thus have two targets, monoamine transporters as well as VMATs. Now let's discuss G-protein linked receptors in some detail. All of these have the structure of seven transmembrane regions, meaning that they span the membrane seven times. Each of the transmembrane regions cluster around a central core that contains a binding site for the neurotransmitter. Drugs can interact at this binding site or at other sites known as the allosteric sites on the receptor. Now this can lead to a wide range of modifications of receptor functions and that is due to mimicking or blocking partially or fully the neurotransmitter function that normally occurs at these receptors. Now let's discuss G-protein linked receptors as target of psychotropic drugs. Now to understand this, we have to first understand the agonist spectrum. Now the first scenario is that there is no agonist at the receptor. Now absence of agonist does not necessarily mean that nothing is happening with the signal transduction at a G-protein linked receptor. Conformational changes may still be occurring at SIM receptor systems but only at very low frequency. This is referred to as constitutive activity which may be present especially in receptor systems and brain areas where there is high density of receptors. Now let's discuss what happens when an agonist is present at the receptor. Now an agonist produces a conformational change in the receptor that turns on the synthesis of second messenger to the greatest extent possible. The full agonist is generally represented by the neurotransmitter itself, but some drugs can also act in the same manner. Thus, an agonist triggers the full array of downstream signal transduction. There are two major ways to stimulate G-protein linked receptors with full agonist action. First, several drugs directly bind to the neurotransmitter site and produce the same array of signal transduction effects as a full agonist. 
and secondly many drugs can indirectly act to boost the levels of the natural full agonist neurotransmitter now this can be achieved by two methods the first one has already been discussed that is inhibition of monoamine transporters like cert net dat and gat1 and the second one is to block the enzymatic destruction of the neurotransmitters now let's discuss what happens when an antagonist is present at the receptor in states of over stimulation blocking the action of the natural neurotransmitter may be desirable an antagonist produces a conformational change in the receptor that causes no change in signal transduction including no change in the constitutive activity that may have been present in the absence of agonist the true antagonists are sometimes called neutral or silent since they have no action of their own antagonists block the action of everything in the agonist spectrum in the presence of an agonist an antagonist will block the action of that agonist but does nothing itself as previously stated the antagonist simply returns the receptor conformation back to the same state as excess when no agonist is present an antagonist will also block the action of a partial agonist now partial agonists are thought to produce a conformational change in the receptor that is intermediate between a full agonist and a baseline conformation of the receptor and finally an antagonist will reverse an inverse agonist now an inverse agonist is thought to produce a conformational state of the receptor that totally inactivates it and even removes the baseline constitutive activity now coming on to partial agonists these produce signal transduction that is something more than an antagonist yet something less than a full agonist this can also be seen as turning up the gains a bit from silent antagonistic actions but not all the way to a full agonist now depending upon how close this partial agonist is to a full agonist or a silent antagonist on the agonist spectrum will determine the impact of a partial agonist on downstream signal transduction events for this reason partial agonists are also called stabilizers since they have the theoretical capacity to find a stable solution between the extremes of too much and too little but they are also sometimes called weak with the implication that partial agonism means partial clinical efficacy and they can appear as net agonist or net antagonist depending upon the amount of naturally occurring full agonist neurotransmitter that is present they can also appear as net agonists or net antagonists depending upon the amount of naturally occurring full agonist neurotransmitter a partial agonist can simultaneously boost deficient neurotransmitter activity yet block excessive neurotransmitter activity and thus may even be able to treat simultaneously states that are mixtures of both excess and deficiency of neurotransmitter activity now coming on to inverse agonists now these agents produce a conformational change in the receptor that stabilizes it in a totally inactive form and thus the result of an inverse agonist is to shut down even the constitutive activity of the receptor system thus in a sense inverse agonist do the opposite of agonists if an agonist increases signal transduction from baseline an inverse agonist decreases it even below the baseline now let's discuss enzymes as targets of psychotropic drugs to understand this first we will have to understand the concepts of irreversible and reversible enzyme inhibition when an irreversible inhibitor binds to the enzyme it cannot be displaced by the substrate and thus sometimes also called suicide inhibitor because it covalently binds to the enzyme protein permanently killing it on the other hand in reversible enzyme inhibition the enzyme substrate is able to compete with the reversible inhibitor for binding to the enzyme whichever wins or predominates depends upon which one has the greater affinity for the enzyme and is present in greater concentration only 3 enzymes are known to be targeted by psychotropic drugs currently used in clinical practice and these are monoamine oxidase acetylcholinesterase and glycogen synthase kinase 
Now glucose synthase kinase also known as GSK3 promotes cell death that is it is pro apoptotic in action it is well known that lithium has the capacity to inhibit this enzyme this can lead to neuroprotective actions and long term plasticity and may contribute to anti manic and mood stabilizing actions of lithium now let's discuss cytochrome p450 drug metabolizing enzymes as targets of psychotropic drugs to better understand this first we have to discuss pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics pharmacokinetics is how the body acts upon the drug especially to absorb distribute metabolize and excrete them this is mediated through hepatic and gut metabolizing systems known as the cytochrome p450 enzyme systems on the other hand pharmacodynamics accounts for the therapeutic effects and side effects of a drug psychotropic drugs are absorbed through the gut wall and then sent to the enzymes in liver to be biotransformed so that the drugs can be sent back into the blood stream to be excreted from the body via kidneys after passing through the gut wall and liver the drug will exist partially as unchanged drug and partially as biotransformed there are over 30 known cyp enzymes and probably many more awaiting discovery these are also polymorphic for example about 5 to 10% of caucasians are poor metabolizers via the enzyme cyp2d6 and approximately 20% of asians may have reduced activity of another cyp enzyme 2c19 so they must metabolize the drugs by alternative routes these patients often have elevated drug levels in their blood streams the genes for these cyp enzymes can now be measured and can be used to predict the range of effect and side effects in any particular patient now let's discuss some common cyp enzymes the first one is cyp1a2 its substrates range from antipsychotics and antidepressants to caffeine and theophylline the antidepressant fluoxamine is its well known inhibitor and can increase side effects including possibly increasing the risk of seizures this enzyme system is also induced by smoking coming on to cyp2d6 its substrates include many antipsychotics and antidepressants several antidepressants are also inhibitors of this enzyme this enzyme converts two drugs risperidone and venlafaxine into active drugs that is paliperidone and desvenlafaxine respectively isinapine is its inhibitor and can raise the levels of drugs that are its substrates now let's discuss cyp3a4 these enzymes metabolizes several psychotropic drugs as well as several of the hmg coa reductase inhibitors that is the statins several psychotropic drugs are weak inhibitors of this enzyme including antidepressants fluoxamine nifedone and the active metabolite of fluoxetine norfloxetine Several non-psychotropic drugs are powerful inhibitors of this enzyme system including ketoconazole some protease inhibitors used for HIV infection and erythromycin and specifically combine a 34A inhibitor with the 34A substrate pemozide can result in elevated plasma pemozide levels with consequent QT prolongations and dangerous cardiac arrhythmias Similarly combining a 34A inhibitor with alprazolam or triazolam can cause significant sedation due to elevated plasma levels and combining a 34A inhibitor with certain cholesterol lowering drugs such as the statins can increase the risk of muscle damage and rhabdomyolysis Some drugs that can induce 3A4 include carbamazepine rifampine and some reverse transcriptase inhibitors used for HIV The scarbamazepine added to the regime of a patient previously stabilized on clozapine, quetiapine, ziprosidone, etc., can reduce the blood and brain levels of these drugs.